Barbara Kaus, and I'm here today with Mary Wilmer and Christian Stabler, and we're here to interview Christian and talk about Christian's book, Redbone, The True Story of a Native American Rock Band, and Christian's background and interest in Redbone, and also the European Redbone fan page that Christian is the webmaster of. So, uh, hi Mary, hi Christian, how are you guys doing today? Good. Awesome. Fine. And just so you know how uh, the world can get along, I'm in Texas right now, Mary's in uh, Michigan, and Christian's in France. So isn't it cool that we can we can do this? Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Uh, the first question I have for you, Christian, is maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background, what you do, and how you uh, came across and got interested in Redbone. So I'm a graphic designer and an illustrator, and I did a... Um, Art school when I was younger, much younger because uh, <laughs> rather not that young anymore. And uh, when I was in art school, I had a teacher who uh, asked us uh, to, to draw an instrument of music, and I, I drew a bass and I told him uh, what kind of music I liked. And he said, uh, "If you like bass, you have to listen to that band." And he brought me uh, the first the first Redbone album that was uh, in his possession, and he he, he offered it to me. So that was uh, the start of uh, my my discovery of, of uh, an incredible band. And uh, after that, uh, I bought what I could at the time in Europe. In France, it wasn't that easy to find uh, albums, especially when you lived in the countryside. So I I bought a few what I found. And uh, afterwards, I'm, I'm more interested in, in fact, in a, I'm very interested in, in progressive rock uh, bands. So I let this, Redbone aside a, a little bit, and when uh, the web internet came out in the, in the start of the 90s, I uh, wanted to have to find the, the, the discography and how, what they did because it was easier than to, to, to try to find out everything that they produced. And so that's how I, uh, I discovered that there was nothing much to find about them on the web at that time in the 90s, and I thought maybe I could do it. So that's how I started the, the web, the web uh, site in the start of, uh, I think, 2000, 2004, something like that. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, on the, the first album, it, um, in the United States, their first album, if you will, had two LPs, and in yes. Europe it had one. And so is there a, a particular um, song or something that caught your ear as a bass player or just the whole um, approach they had to music or um... I think it's but, but strangely I think my, my teacher he, he, the, this professor gave me a double album I don't yeah, know where I found it States. but it was a double album yeah okay and um, I think the first side of, of it was just amazing uh, um, King Kong beat and uh, Play story rhythm and uh, all the all the, the great songs that on uh, on that album. The first the first side especially I liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I did too. Um, for me, I, it was the song. It came later on. It was the songs like Maggie, but mm -hmm. the more I kind of jumped in. You were talking about the bass beat. There's a song called Twenty Three and Me. Yeah. Where the bass beat is the foundation of the song. So um, I'm I'm sure it would draw someone in. So when you yeah, it's, it, go ahead, no, it's strange because uh, Redbone. When you listen to it, you think yeah, it's it's easy to play, and when you try to play it, it's almost impossible. <laughs> Especially the bass, I, I, and a song like "Come Come and Get Your Love" seems really easy to 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 play, yeah. but it's really uh, in the, very difficult. Yeah, it's very compl complex. Yeah. So, and uh, it's little details and changes, uh, the tempo cha changes, and it's really, it's really fascinating. Now, as you mentioned, we have the internet now, and I know I'm always digging for pictures or information or articles. Um, where did you find things before the internet? I, I can't imagine what you had to do to get the information about Redbone. At the start of the website, you mean? Uh, yes, to get the yeah. things before they were out there, because a lot of the information you put up first. Yeah, I had uh, some, um, how do you say, articles, um, newspaper, newspapers, um, uh, yes, uh, um, 
pages that I that I had in magazines uh, that talked about red bone. So I had it. I scanned them, and uh, that's the first thing I did. And then afterwards, I, I also there was um, this this um, fun fun club. I don't know if it was really a club, but uh, in uh, in Holland there were a few really great fans. Um, like Ellen Boot and uh, Sandra van der Meiden, they had already a, a little website. So I, I contacted them really early and uh, they, we exchanged things. Well, I, I gave them what I found and they gave me, so we enriched one another very quickly. So I'm gonna ask a question that you may not know the answer to, but I've thought about this a lot. Um, Redbone's music is exceptional. All, all of the uh, players are almost prodigy level. They're so good. And that includes all of the drummers through the year and the bandmates. Um, Pat and Lolly seem to have a talent for um, picking people who, who really knew their craft and could go anywhere mm -hmm. with it. But all that being said, Redbone was more successful in Europe than they were in the United States. and. Do you have any thoughts on why you think that is? Yeah, in, in the seventies there was anyway a, a great fascination for Western mu uh, movies and uh, um, the the American Indi uh, American uh, American Indians and uh, this was a uh, we, we were all fascinated by that and I think the the, the music just came as a, something uh, from another planet in in Europe. And I think we hadn't that, uh, maybe we hadn't that, that race um, antagonism mm -hmm. against them. So we accepted right. them may maybe more easily than you did in the United States. For us, it was just an, a band, a good band. And uh, if there were um, American Indians or not, was not really a, 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 a big deal. I think it, that's the reason. And they, they, they did really big hits like, uh, Maggie and uh, Rich Queen of New Orleans were really, were really big, big hits in, in, in France. Right. So. Um, right. The, yeah, they had to break a lot of glass ceilings for sure in the United States. And then, of course, we all know about um, we were all wounded at Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of uh, times when they went to concert venues, they were asked not to play that. Um, and they were um, not played readily on the radio. Most yeah. jockeys wouldn't play that. Yet that was a song that was a number one song in many countries in Europe. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think maybe that's a good example of it. Mary, did you have any questions about for Kristen about his um, Christian about his background or um, love of Redbone? How much research did you have to do before beginning the book, Christian? Oh, uh, it had to I, go beyond newspapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, um, at the time in 2008, I think it was, yeah, 2008, uh, um, Pete Depot was uh, living in, in uh, Holland. And um, so I went there to, to meet him, to make interviews of him for the, for the website. So. That's how I started to uh, to get more information, direct information from him, and uh, we we talked a lot through emails after that, and uh, he introduced me to Pat also. So I, I then started to do interviews uh, through phone with Pat Vegas, and uh, that's how I completed the website and uh, I started. And in fact, it was Pete the Post who first started to to think about the book, and I said, yeah, but. Uh, just telling a story about the little incidents in uh, concerts and gigs. I didn't find it very interesting until I learned that uh, Pete was uh, was taken from his parents to 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 get in a board in a board school. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've done that. That's how, when I thought, um, yeah, there is more than just a story of a rock band in this uh, in this story. You know, I actually. Used to live in the city where the boarding school is, the Shamawa Indian School. It's in Salem, Oregon, and I grew up there. So I, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I'm going to wrap up this segment, and so the next segment, I think that we could go right into talking about um, the book and okay. how it came to be. And so I'll wrap this one up, segment one, and I'll see you guys back for segment two. <laughs>